Hey guys, it's Brian with Retired at 40. Last week I left you with some information about getting the most money out of your, your primary residence that you live in. And this week we're going to talk about one of the best, if not the best, tax loopholes when it comes to real estate. So today we're learning about the 1031 exchange. So you might be wondering why I'm, I'm recording this in the car, and that's because the best way to show you something is to show you an actual example of what I'm teaching. I'm in the middle of moving most of my stuff to our, our new house in Iowa, and we're actually getting ready to close on our final investment property that we have in Colorado, which happens to be a 1031. So many of you are gonna be wondering what in the heck is a 1031 exchange? And I wanna clarify, this is all legal stuff. This has been around forever. People have been doing this for, I don't know, as long as people have owned real estate, probably. So we're closing very soon on our last investment property in Colorado. Um, we purchased the property for $53,000 back in somewhere around, I think, 2010. And at the time, we were in a major recession. Real estate was, you know, they were trying to, they were basically just giving real estate away, especially here in Colorado. We are one of the hardest hit states. So we're currently under contract on this property for right around $260,000, just right under. We'll call it 260 just so we can have a nice round number. So that gives us a beautiful tidy profit in about 10 years of. So if you were doing a typical investment property real estate sale, you'd be exposed to over $200,000 in capital gains. And your capital gains is gonna be dependent on which tax bracket you're in, which could take almost up to half of your profits in some cases. All right, hold on. That was way too much to explain in a moving van going 63 miles per hour. So I wanna clarify all this. Here's capital gains in a nutshell, at least as far as 1031s and real estate is concerned. So let's start off with single filers. If you make under $40,000, your capital gains is actually 0%. But that doesn't really apply to most people that are going to be doing this kind of thing. So, so most people will fall into the 15% capital gains tax bracket. And that's going to cover anyone who's making $40,001 all the way up to $441,500. And this is, of course, annual income. Now, if you're above that $441,500 for your annual income, you're going to get hit with a 20% capital gains rate. Now, if you're married, the tax rates are going to go up just a bit because you're going to get hit with a marriage tax penalty here. That seems unfair, doesn't it? Married couples making less than $80,000 per year are gonna be able to take advantage of that 0% tax. However, if you make in between $80,001 and $496,000 per year, you're gonna jump up to that 15% capital gains rate. And then anyone that's making more than $496,000 a year is gonna bump up to the 20%. So all this info comes from Forbes magazine, but like always, I'm not an accountant. If you're not an accountant, probably go spend the money and save yourself some headaches in the future. And most importantly, these rates are coming for if you've owned the property for more than one year. If you've owned it for less than one year, which is what they call a short-term ownership, you're gonna be exposed to your regular income tax bracket. So the beauty of the 1031 exchange is you can take all of that sales price and you could roll it into one property or two properties or multiple properties, all tax-free. So you can take a small house, and you could roll it into a bigger house that's that's either more money and you can add the extra money on top or you could take a condo and you could roll it into a multifamily or you could take a multifamily and roll it into a piece of commercial property so there's really no limit on the type of property that you can do this to you could actually do this to a, a multifamily home you could do it to an apartment building. You could do it to a massive building in a downtown area. As long as you follow these simple rules. And before I give you these rules, don't take my word as the gospel. Make sure that you consult a professional. You're gonna have to run all this through a 1031 company anyway. Give them a call, pick up the phone, give them a call and make sure that you're doing something that's totally legal that's not gonna come back to bite you in the future. So here are seven key factors to keep in mind. This came directly from my 1031 exchange company. The first requirement is you have to have the right type of property. This means that the new property and the old property have to be either used for an investment or for business purposes. This means that it can either be vacant land, a rental type property, or a property used for trade or business. And this might sound kind of obvious, but this also only applies to real estate. It can't be used for farm equipment or artwork or something like that. 
Number three is a real important one. You have to use a qualified intermediary, which means you have to run the entire process through a 1031 exchange company. There are companies that just handle this exclusively. This really just keeps the whole thing legit and to make sure that you're jumping through the correct hoops. But you can't just use your real estate broker or your friend who thinks they know what they're talking about or your accountant or a lawyer. It has to go through a qualified person, otherwise you might be left holding the bag for lots of money. The intermediary also holds the funds of your profits from the sale of the property. And that's really just to make sure that nothing fishy is going on with the funds or that you're collecting more of a profit from those funds until you close on another sale. Number four, you have 45 days to identify your new property or properties from the sale date of your old property. Number five, and then you have 180 days to close on the identified properties from the sale date of the old property. Number six is you have to have the same title holder in the new property as you did in the old property. So if it was held in a company's name, you can't use your company's name and transfer it into your personal or vice versa or any different version of that. Number seven is lucky number seven because it involves the money. You must uh, reinvest all profits from the sale to avoid all taxes and the recapture of depreciation. If you don't reinvest all of the profits, it's what's known as a boot and the boot the boot would be anything that's left over after you've purchased your next property or properties, and it can be open to taxation of up to 25%. I'm also gonna give you a bonus tip. Click that subscribe button and click the bell to get notifications of future videos. I'm gonna have plenty more videos like this coming out. Also click that like button until it turns blue for the YouTube algorithm. Okay, so I said earlier that the best way to show you this is to give you an example. So I'm gonna give you our example. I'm actually headed to Iowa right now. Um, in Iowa, you basically get two properties, that the kind of properties that we like for the one property that we sold in Colorado. So we sold a townhome and we're buying two condos. We really like condos. It's a personal, personal preference for us. Uh, we, we like the most hands-off type of rentals that we can get, especially because we're going into retirement. The last thing I wanna do is have to go fix a roof or mow a lawn or do something like that. You know, I want to be able to pick up and leave town or, or just really just have the freedom of being retired and not have to constantly worry about rentals all the time. So in preparation for this video, I actually had a bunch of footage. I went into our property that we're selling in Colorado and I did a tour of the house and blah, blah, blah. And of course, my hard drive that I store all of my video on for all these videos just went kaput on me. I'm trying to recover all of the information. I lost potentially two terabytes of video, which is about 75% of the video that I've ever shot for Retired at 40. But here's a couple pictures of the property. This is a three bed, three bath townhome. It's almost 1,500 square feet. We had a tenant in there that was renting it for about 1,400 a month, but I think with today's prices, we could easily have gotten 1,800 per month. But now I'm gonna show you the two properties that we purchased in Iowa. One's still under contract. We're gonna close as soon as we get there and one has already been closed. So let's go look at the properties that I bought and then we'll go over some financials after, after we're done doing that. And uh, I'll show you how much money that I saved having not had to pay taxes. So our first property is a three bed, two bath condo. It's just over 1200 square feet and it does include a one car garage as well. And you can see that it's full of stuff right now. The, the owner has not moved out but we paid 130,000 for this. And even though it's hard to tell, the owner did do some upgrades just before they listed it. Um, they had put solid surfaces everywhere. Uh, they had just painted it. And we've acquired a handful of these three bed, two baths because they're ideal for a small family or um, a couple of roommates that wanna live together. And they tend to rent faster than the two bed, two bath. And we actually have another unit in this building that's renting for $1,300 a month. The second property is also a three bed, two bath. It's a little bit bigger than the last one. It's almost 1300 square feet. It also includes a one car garage and we paid 138,000 for this property. This one has been completely remodeled. It has new carpet, new paint, new appliances. This one also has a few bonuses like a swimming pool. It's got a secured entrance, a gas fireplace, and it's also in a very desirable part of town. It's within walking distance of a very trendy part of Des Moines. And we have a smaller unit in this building we're getting 1200 out of, so I don't think we'll have any problem getting 1350 out of this one. 
So there's our real example of our 1031, and now here's the nuts and bolts for the financials of how much we saved for not having to pay taxes. So one of the biggest benefits of owning real estate is that you can take depreciation on an asset that depreciates, but it can also come back to hurt you if you don't know what you're doing. So we were taking $3,000 per year for depreciation over the course of eight years that we own the property. So that equals $24,000. Had we just sold the property, instead of doing a 1031, we would have to pay 25% recapture fee uh, on that $24,000, which equals $6,000. So we're saving $6,000 right away. Our proceeds after realtor fees, title fees, property taxes, and HOA fees was about $248,000. And don't forget your 1031 exchange company's fee of $1,000. And then take out our $53,000 purchase price. That gives us $196,000. And then you're going to multiply that times the 15% capital gains tax, which we figured out earlier in the video. That's a total of $29,400, but don't forget that $6,000 recapture fee that we had earlier. So had we not done a 1031, that would mean we were on the hook for $35,400. So the 1031 not only benefited us by not paying taxes, but it also took one property and turned it into two, which can eventually lead to more 1031s in the future. So thanks for joining me today on my 1031. If you've had any experience with 1031s, good or bad, make sure you leave it in the comments section for me, or you can also go to the Facebook page and post a comment there. In the meantime, this is Retired at 40. Remember to live life simple, and we'll catch you next week.